All right, welcome back everybody. I'm Hunter Bennett Daggett. I'll be your moderator for this session. This is session 3C2, Construction and Alternative Delivery. Our next presenter is Kathleen Kelleher. Kathleen has a BS from the University of Washington in Bioresources Science and Engineering, an MBA from the University of Utah. She spent the first part of her career in chemical water treatment for heavy industrial processes, working with process and wastewater applications. From there, she worked in water filtration for municipal and industrial clients across Western North America. Through Amoresco, Kathleen looks forward to bringing the energy and water world together to address the needs clients have and find creative solutions. Thank you, Hunter. Um, yeah, so I'm Kathleen and I work for Amoresco, um, but I'll speak broadly um, from all of ESCOs as much as possible. Before we get started, how many of you know about energy savings performance contracting? Okay, 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 good. This is exciting. Um, so yeah, I'm here to talk to you more about how we can mitigate financial and technical risk through utilizing energy savings performance contracting. And um, our, our pathway for today um, today's session is to go over terminology um, in our industry. There are so many acronyms. And then once you're used to them, you kind of forget that everyone else is not. So we're going to get that out of the way first. Uh, review some benefits um, while you're probably in the audience today. Uh, look at different contracting types. Um, talk about the state support for energy savings performance contracting. Then get into how it actually works, some examples in action, and some funding opportunities. So first. Energy Savings Performance Contracting, ESPC. Um, it's a public procurement approach to identify, implement, and finance infrastructure improvements that either save energy or produce energy. So there has to be some type of energy component. And I'll use ESPC a lot uh, throughout this, obviously. And then ESCO, like Amer ESCO, is an energy services company. So um, the ESCO's job is to be the entity that performs the in-depth audits, um, identifies any savings or production opportunities, and then designs and um, implements the, the improvements and uh, acts as a general contractor throughout it all. Through this, there's three guarantees um, in, in the project. The maximum project cost uh, and that's a one-way street. So if um, the ESCO says this project will be $2 million, and it comes in at 2.4, tough bananas, ESCO has to foot the $400,000 um, of, of uh, over budget cost. But it's a one-way street. If the project is estimated at 2 million, comes in at 1.8 million, then that $200,000 of unspent um, monies stays with the client. So that's the first guarantee. The second is the energy savings or energy production. And the third is the performance um, if there's equipment uh, that is tied to the project. Another huge benefit of utilizing ESPC is the ability to take the savings to fund the improvements. So I have um, an example here. They, you're essentially upgrading your infrastructure or your equipment, taking that savings um, by replacing um, and, and improving your system and moving it to the front. So uh, walking through this example, say your, uh, your city spends $200,000 on utility bills every year. An ESCO will normally come in and be able to save 15 to 20% just on better equipment that's out there. New boilers, new aerators, better lighting, um, a whole range of, of new technologies that are out there. Those all cost money, of course, capital um, to, to uh, provide that equipment. But through ESPC, you're allowed to realize that theoretical savings year over year and bring it to the front of the project, almost like a down payment to help fund it. Or um, in this example, it's an entirely self-funding project. So uh, in these numbers, utility bill of $200,000 a year, let's say we can save 20%, that's $40,000 every year. And then um, generally we see like the the project timeline or the um, loan, 15 years, so 15 times 40, you have $600,000 today that you can use to buy the boiler. 
you know, help um, buy the aerator or, you know, improve lighting HVAC throughout the facilities. The bar graph on the right is just a, another representation of this where you're taking the utility spend before ESPC. You know that there's better technologies, technologies out there and you're able to get them tomorrow um, utilizing the future energy savings. And then after the loan, you recognize the full savings. Now, this was all um, designed to help uh, move, move the needle in the right direction, right? There's better equipment out there. Um, how can we replace old aging infrastructure and get um, newer um, infrastructure implemented? So a recap of what the benefits are. With ESPC, um, it's another contracting vehicle for your toolbox or another tool in your tool belt. Uh, it, it's not gonna be the end all be all, right? There's design bid build, progressive design build, um, really great options for, for all sorts of projects. But when you have an energy related project, um, I'm really excited to, to talk about this because it's a, a great tool to help um, bring some funding to it as well. It's also an extension of your staff and project management team. Um, ESCOs work on the behalf of the client, um, but will also, you know, uh, subcontract consulting engineers and um, engineer record um, to, to help make these projects happen. It mitigates financial and technical risk on the projects. You are working to, to get these performance and price guarantees. And then it fulfills your public procurement requirements. So, um, you know, once you select the ESPC project uh, process, then you can direct select uh, equipment that you want. If you have 14 pumps that are all the same brand, you can go after that 15th one uh, without having to go out to bid. Um, or if you have a neighboring city that really loves their UV and that's what you want to do at your site, um, no problem, uh, sole source is, is an option since you've already fulfilled your public procurement requirements. And it's all meant to upgrade equipment. Again, move the needle to a more sustainable future. And it's another avenue to provide collaboration, resources, and perspectives. Okay, so I'm going to um, talk about some other contracting methods and compare them to ESPC uh, to help kind of show the differences when it's an energy related project. So um, say a project comes across your, your desk and you're looking at how do we how do we make it happen? And you have all these options and a whole bunch more acronyms, <laughs> CMGC, DBOOM, it can get overwhelming. And so uh, looking at what are the key differences? What aspects do I, do I wanna pull into the project? What am I staffed for? Do we have a lot of turnover right now? And you know, we want to, to um, have someone be a partner for, for the long haul, which is the most appropriate. And then how do you feel about risk? Is this something you've already done, no big deal? Or is it a new technology um, that you'd like some guarantees around? So as it um, applies to energy related projects, we have this diagram um, and it's, you know, it, not, there's a, there's a lot of red on, uh, on these, but there, there's ways to adjust and, and uh, take some risk off um, the owner. But from the owner's perspective, you know, we hear about the concern of capital cost overruns. Um, how do you look at all these different technologies and decide, um, do we want low cost or do we want best value? Uh, what, what's gonna be good for us in five, 10 years? How do we allocate all the resources and staffing for the project? And um, what about the operational costs in the future uh, or, or today, the environmental compliance? or um, energy cost escalation that we're all feeling. So um, it might be hard to see, but just uh, across it, uh, the, the first column is the price risk stays with the owner. Um, performance risk stays with the owner. Bid selection is based on uh, low cost versus best value and staffing resources that are needed and how to obtain sourcing uh, financing grants and whatnot. And so this is you know, how we see energy efficiency projects um, and how the, the risk is kind of dispersed onto the, the owner. Now, in my previous careers, I had a lot of experience with design bid build 
And this was um, a struggle for me in, in quite a few of the projects, not, not all by, by any means. But um, in comparison, looking at design bid build, uh, it can be costly and lengthy, especially with turnover, uh, you're working with new teams, um, and, and then it's a three-year process. And if you have an open bid day in eight hours, it can, it can go differently. Um, and so in, in that, pardon me, uh, during that competitive bid process, you might end up with equipment that, you know, kind of fits, but it wasn't what the original design was around. We're gonna have to repipe some things. And, and so uh, it can be um, <clears throat> driven by lowest initial cost, but not the best value. And so when uh, we have our energy hats on, we're thinking, is this gonna cost us more to operate every single year? Is this gonna last for longer? Um, so design bid build might not take that into account. Also, collaboration between the parties can be prone to conflict um, after the, the bid process. And, you know, are we, are we still working with the same team members even? Um, a, especially, you know, bringing in the manufacturers, the manufacturer's rep, there's a lot of moving parts. And then the outcomes are not always performance-based. And so there's a high degree of owner involvement and owner risk. So for energy-related projects, this might not be the best approach. When we look at ESPC, this was the approach designed for, for energy related projects uh, because you have a single source of accountability, the ESCO. Um, your contractors, your city engineer, or your um, engineer of record, everybody wraps up underneath the ESCO because they hold all the guarantees. And so they have to make sure this is indeed gonna perform. perform. It's also a very turnkey approach. Uh, the owner has the, the control to, um, uh, identify what equipment they want, what's worked well. <clears throat> uh, it offers another collaborative design and delivery. We've had a lot of success working with uh, the city consulting engineer and contractors to identify exactly what the project will look like in the end uh, from start to finish. And the owner can select best value solutions. So uh, if they have an electrical contractor that is like, hey, this guy's done a lot of great work for us, this is who we would like um, to, to be on this project. You have um, that ability to do that because you've fulfilled your pub public procurement requirements. There's also open book pricing. So um, at the end of the day, you see exactly what it costs. And uh, that transparency um, in, in everything mentioned above really helps the ESPC uh, guarantee these project costs, um, the performance and any resource savings or production. And so for an energy related project, it's very cost effective and transparent and nimble. So if everything sounds like pretty cool so far, you're like, okay, is this really real? Um, yes, so there's a lot of state support um, and we'll talk about Washington, Oregon and Idaho. Um, it's a little small, but those are all the RCWs related to Washington. Now, Washington operates through the Department of Enterprise Services, DES. And um, DES has been doing this, I think, since 1984, and they've implemented over $1.5 billion worth of ESPC projects. And the whole goal was to protect these public funds, but also replace equipment. You know, how often do we hear, if it's not broke, don't fix it? Um, but we, we know that that boiler is the bane of our existence. It needs, it needs to be replaced. Or, or there's a, a better UV out there. We need VFD pumps whatever it is, um, yeah, the, the idea was, how do we get these infrastructure improvements while protecting public funds and putting everybody at ease that it will indeed work. And so um, this works for cities, K through 12 schools, um, PUDs, everybody um, that's in the, the public sector in Washington. As for Oregon, so there's a through, oh, and um, sorry, backing up real quick. DES does um, offer support and they'll go to city council meetings with you and whatnot and, and advocate for, this is indeed a great pathway for an energy related project. Um, as for Oregon, they go through the Department of Energy and so ODOE, and this is just a screenshot of their website, but you can see so many resources 
um, qualified ESCOs, big example audits, a lot of resources um, available. And then they have like a whole list of recommended energy efficiency measures, what they call them, um, to, to tackle. It's like, oh, these are slam dunk ones to, to use in this process. Um, one thing I like that ODOE says is, rather than wait for older inefficient equipment to fail and costing more in the meantime, performance contracting allows for the facility improvements to be budgeted out of future utility savings. This shifts much of the risk associated with an energy efficiency project from the agency to the ESCO. So, you know, there's a lot of good support in um, Oregon for this. And now for Idaho, this is through the Department of Administration. And this is actually, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of SPOT, but it's State Policy Opportunity Tracker. And it's a, it's a great resource for looking at policies and um, what all the states are doing throughout the US. And so here is Idaho. And um, out of the, the, five, um, the five boxes here, oops. <clears throat> uh, that they could have checked, um, there is, is there a clear legislative executive authorization? Is there um, program administrated by a state agency? Third party involved oversight for the program? Um, model contracts available, and then also a list of pre-approved ESCOs. And so uh, they check four of the boxes, but not this pre-approved ESCO. So, I mean, obviously call me first, but <laughs> an equally valid thing would be to look at Washington and Oregon's uh, qualified ESCOs. Um, <clears throat> so they, they, this is a fun website because you can also look at all these different metrics and how Idaho compares to Alabama, compares to New York. Um, in their clean energy policy making. Okay, this still sounds good. Uh, the mechanics of ESPC. So what actually happens? This is um, our approach and I think quite similar for all ESCOs, but the first is a concept introduction. And this is where I really wanna plug, it's not just for cities, but also consulting engineers and for contractors because we're all boots on the ground trying to, to move the needle in the right direction. And sometimes uh, the consulting engineers is like, gosh, I know this project is what they need. We have a perfect solution, but they don't have the funding. If it has an energy component, we can help you know, give it some lift and get it off the ground. Um, so concept introductions are really just this, talking about ESPC, see if there's a good project, uh, low risk, and, and in fact, pretty awesome because most of the time like we bring lunch or cookies or something. So <laughs> that, that's just to see if it's a good fit. Um, and the action item is, you know, it, if uh, a partnership looks like, hey, let, let, let's continue, um, we'll ask you to sign a memo of understanding saying Kathleen is allowed on site, the state to see these facilities um, and continue. And then the feasibility analysis. So this is where we want all the information dump. We wanna know all the pain points. What do you wanna see? What are your community's objectives? And a chance for us to look around and say, oh, you could totally do solar here or a microgrid would be helpful here. Those aerators could be replaced. We're gonna create this list together. Um, <clears throat> that is anything that could be done uh, and, and fits the scope. And so depending on the state, um, that report is either produced or you select an ESCO, vice versa. And uh, from here, this is the project development where you have your first financial commitment because this is where it gets nitty gritty and we'll present that first report saying, there's the 50 things we can do together. And at that time you can be like, it's way too much. I, I'm not into it right now. Or I wanna uh, continue then the investment grade audit is where data loggers are put in. Um, lots of information is gathered. This is what generates the framework for all the guarantees. So um, if, if for some reason we provide that investment grade audit and uh, the city council changes is like, nope, we're, we're done, we don't wanna do it. You'd have to pay us to go away. So pretty low cost. Um, and, and you'd obviously have that, that price before we even started. But that, that's um, what I mean by the financial commitment is up until that point, it's just trying to see if there's a good partnership in the project in line. 
Um, so say all is good. Investment grade audit, we take all those measures and projects we thought about, we put numbers to them. We said, this is how much is, it's gonna cost. We talked to the contractors. We found the equipment. This is where we think you can save energy, produce energy, um, and the ROI on those. And we'll put it in an energy services proposal. And you'll be able to say, okay, I, I wanna do half of this or all of it. And uh, <clears throat> so from there, then we'd go into contracting. <clears throat> and then, oh gosh. <clears throat> Oh, thank you. <laughs> the smoke. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, go into construction and implementation. And uh, <clears throat> this is where it's meant to be incredibly turnkey. Uh, we'll keep you com uh, communication lines open, um, but we're fielding all of the day-to-day -day calls for, uh, from electrical and mechanical contractors, any type of trouble. Um, it, and at the end of it, uh, we'll be around for a year to do measurement and verification to ensure, yes, and did, indeed, it meets the performance, price, and energy savings that we said it would. And um, during this process, <clears throat> these last three stages, <clears throat> um, we, we really like to do a lot of public outreach. And uh, I mean, I sure... I don't know if you guys get calls that say, hey, I'm so glad my to toilet flushed today. <laughs> it's not often that we get, you know, um, told we're doing a great job. And so we really try and, you know, talk about uh, all the great work that's being done. <clears throat> okay, this is good because this will give me a break. Um, bear with me, but <clears throat> I have an activity for us. Uh, personal goal setting. I know, a little cheesy, but uh, if you can get a blank piece of paper or your notes app in your phone, and then uh, I'll give you a minute while I try and figure out my voice um, to write down at least 10 goals that you want to accomplish in the next 12 months. So as fast as you can, 10 personal goals. Uh, I know it's quite the, the change of topic. So I have some example ones. Um, family, career, financial, if you wanna go after a promotion, save some money. Does everyone have 10? <laughs> a few will do, a few will do. Okay, so now think about your goals and then imagine I had a magic wand and I could make one of those goals just happen right now. Which goal would move the needle in your life the most and help all those subsequent goals seem so much more achievable? And then circle that goal and then that becomes your, your mission critical goal, where you put 80% of your energy to and say, hey, if I, if I tackle this, it'll make everything else fall in line so much easier. And, uh, and so how this relates <laughs> is with these investment grade audits, they, um, there's always a few things that just rise to, to the top, whether it's grants or whether it's like, this will relieve the heartache of our operations staff 
there's always a few energy conservation measures that are gonna make the project. Um, some of them have really fast ROIs. Some of them, like I said, reduce just the headache of it all. And uh, this is way too small, but it's just a screenshot of the top of, of these IGAs. And we um, will walk through with the client and turn them on and off and say, okay, this is what the project would look like if you did all the lighting and the aerators, but you didn't replace the boiler. And we'll go through that and look at the payback, look at how much electricity or energy you would save, water um, savings. So uh, yeah, that's how going through the process helps identify what, what could really help the facility. Um, so examples in action. The city of Sela, um, very close to my hometown, uh, they were frustrated for over a year just trying to get a blower. And they had a specific blower they wanted, but they couldn't get it through their traditional design bid build process. And then they heard about ESPC and it alleviated that risk and they were able to get exactly what they wanted um, by doing a direct select of the specific equipment and then we stuck around and did um, just this whole same, same investment grade audit and found that there were other opportunities at the wastewater treatment facility, <clears throat> including lagoon mis mixers um, and improvements to the lift pumps and motors. Additionally, citywide interior and exterior lighting upgrades. Um, and we were able to apply for um, a DEC grant of over $400,000 and won that and help them get over $130,000 in incentives. So that, that project, you know, uh, help, help them get what they wanted, but also open up a whole bunch of other slam dunk opportunities. Uh, the city of Bend, Oregon, street lighting and solar, pretty straightforward. Um, their community climate action plan wanted them to reduce their carbon emissions. So by pairing a, a project like solar, that sometimes have a, has a, a long payback, with um, street lighting, we were able to make it uh, fit their, um, their, their payback period, and then also uh, able to reduce the utility costs by over $200,000 annually. One thing I wanna mention on this is um, there's a, a concert, um, the, the Dark Side Skies group there. They're like, gosh, we don't wanna do, do LEDs on our street lights, so that's gonna be way too bright. Well, it turns out um, we are able to bring a whole bunch of data and research to them LEDs are a lot more focused um, and we're able to reduce the light pollution more than what they currently had. And so now they're, they're advocates for, hey, LEDs are the way of the future. City of Troutdale, um, wastewater treatment plant upgrades. Uh, the project here, it alleviates the risk associated with the aging equipment while reducing annual energy, gas, and water costs. And this was upgrades to the blowers to fewer diffusers, UV system, and distribution piping throughout the, um, the plant. The city of Edmonds, with, this is a citywide efficiency and wastewater treatment upgrades over more than a decade. And the team uh, has just been so neat because um, it started with HVAC uh, at the city hall and, and library. And then it progressed to, oh gosh, you know, maybe we can upgrade our blowers. And then um, further, you know, citywide upgrades, and uh, just doing this for for eight phases, and now on the carbon recovery project at the wastewater treatment plant. And then city of Phoenix, um, this one, it, it ended up being a D boom, a design, build, own, operate, and maintain, um, because there were quite a few moving parts. And the cool thing was Amresco was able to be kind of the glue between. Um, the, the different parties involved. Um, so first, just all the different cities that wanted to do RNG, but having someone hold all the liability and the risk, um, the, that's when Amresco stepped in and helped uh, five cities, Phoenix, Glendale, Mesa, Scottsdale, and Tempe um, do this RNG plant. And so Amresco has a whole RNG team dedicated to, um, to uh, uh, the, this RNG facility. Okay, I know I'm running out of time, and so I want to talk about funding because this is always exciting. Um, so, for funding and financing, 
AMRESCO doesn't charge uh, clients for this, um, but the utility incentives, uh, grant writing, pass through tax credits, that all goes to the, the client. And we, we do a lot of grant writing. Okay, across the PNW, rapid fast. Uh, so here's just a few examples. Um, the Department of Commerce in Washington State, they have applications for electrification of transportation. If you want EV charging, you know, it, it's right there. A, a grant, uh, I think it's a million dollars. Um, it is closing the 15th though. So <laughs> gotta get on that one. Um, and then Idaho, community development block grants, uh, all the states have these. But we, we look to apply to those um, when it makes sense and it's in the, the um, qualifying communities. And then uh, in Oregon, a community renewable energy grant program, this grant just, um, so they, they have three, potentially four grants. One, uh, the first one just closed and um, then it, there should be a second one at the end of this year. And it's really neat because the last one, uh, they were giving up to a hundred and, sorry, a hundred thousand dollars just for planning, like not construction, just to, to investigate, is this a good idea um, for renewable or resiliency type projects um, and up to a million dollars for shovel ready projects. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Inflation Reduction Act, but uh, there's a lot going on, a lot of monies that will be made available um, over 369 billion for energy security, carbon emissions, um, increase energy innovation and support environmental justice objectives. And this is something um, that you know we're, we're keyed into, how do we help um, and be equitable in our help uh, in microgrids. You know, do you want solar PV with battery energy storage? There's so much great opportunity. And now I think we're starting to get the funding to make it happen. And so my takeaways for today, I know it's kind of fast at the end. ESPC, Energy Savings Performance Contracting, provides three guarantees, price, performance, and energy savings. ESCO is the entity that delivers an ESPC project and holds all that you know, liability and make sure those guarantees happen. And then reach out. Um, yeah, the concept introductions, really low risk and a great way to see if there's anything out there that makes sense to partner on and uh, a good way to see what types of funding and financing um, are available. And thank you so much. Okay, we have six or seven minutes for questions. So uh, raise your hand if you've got a question. When the price of energy is so variable and your the financing slide you shared assumed a 20% savings of energy, but it seems like the cost of energy could fluctuate so much over those 15 years. Is it based on the price of energy today or it tracks an index that, of the cost of energy? Yeah, uh, so that's a, a great question. The, the guarantees are always around kilowatt hours um, because there's so much fluctuation in price. Um, but I think we can all see that it, it seems like prices are gonna go up. Um, so we, we stay around the kilowatt hours of electricity saved um, in terms of all the guarantees. Okay. And sorry. Oh. And to answer, yeah, but uh, it is, um, if we're building a project around that, uh, it is from that day um, or, or from when the contract is signed that the um, value hold to the front um, uh, of the project. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I have a question on the competitive, the procurement phase. It wasn't clear to me. Um, what are you bidding on or how are we selecting an ESCP oh, yeah. or an ESCO? Like, what, what are you, do you need a design? Is it like, what are we basing it on? You can direct select. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is that simple. Um, so Oregon uh, and Washington have um, statutes where you, if you choose to do ESP, ESPC, you can just direct select an ESCO um, to do it. Now, many people like to go out for RFQ or RFP of the ESCO. 
Um, so in Oregon, we see that quite a bit where, okay, you know, I know there, there's this here, but there's only a handful of, of cities who, who've done direct select um, in Oregon. And so they'll create a request for qualifications of, can you handle what, what I'm asking? Can you build a microgrid? Can you um, look at my wastewater treatment plant and make these energy efficiency upgrades? Now, once you've selected the ESPC approach, um, then we, we can do um, sole source on equipment or whatnot. We also find that um, perhaps uh, the, the city wants to do a bid within the ESPC approach and like all UV systems are the same to me. I wanna see what they have. And so we'll set up a competitive bid within that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so it's like a progressive design build, but you get to direct select, <laughs> something like that? Yeah, uh, so through Washington, you would um, generally sign an agreement with the Department of Enterprise Services, and then they would set up the, the contract uh, between the city themselves and the ESCO. Okay. How many ESCOs are there around? Um, it depends on the state, you know, uh, yeah. So forgive me, qualified ESCOs in Washington state, I wanna say there's a dozen and maybe only six in Oregon. Um, and then as you saw on the Idaho one, um, they're, you know, uh, well, yeah, unlimited potentially, but, um, yeah, it, and then you can see how active that ESCO has been in the in the state. Yeah. I was just wondering how you um, you or your colleagues stay on top of emerging technologies for decreasing current energy use and savings. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it's a lot of going to conferences and um, trying to be as involved externally as we can, but also within our company, um, we have monthly um, just updates on the, the, the different technologies in each market space. And so that's been very helpful, especially um, I think microgrids uh, has been a hot topic uh, the last few months. Other questions? Yes, my question, not to sound too cynical, what is the upside for the ESCO? If it seems like you're taking on a lot of risk and there's not a lot of reward. If the, if the price comes in lower, normally a contractor would get some of that money and lower the cost. You would not. So where are you making the money? Oh, it, yeah, it's just a straight across margin. Yeah, and so depending on the size of the project, and that's why, you know, um, larger projects are a little easier because there is just kind of this, this uh, admin, right? Like, like every time we come out there, right? That's the um, a set cost. And so on larger projects, um, the, the margin changes. Uh, but yeah, we have a margin and it's open book pricing. So you can see what that is um, across the board. I guess what happens if the energy guarantee is not met? That's a good question, yes. Um, so we, we try and make it right. There's, there's two options, um, just continuing to uh, change out the equipment or, or find where our calculations may have gone wrong. Um, and really, you know, the idea is to, to better our community. And so continuously trying to fix it at our cost, our cost. Um, the second is writing a check for, for the difference. Um, the, we said we'd save you this many kilowatts and we didn't. And so we, we write a check um, and you know, say, sorry, we'll, we'll try and do better next time. Um, but that is, th th those are the two consequences. Okay, our time is up. Thank you, Kathleen. Thanks.